This might be the craziest graph in biology. For billions of years, life stayed small, like bacteria. And then 500 million years ago, we had the Cambrian explosion, which created all of this big life, plants and fungi and animals. And even after five mass extinctions, we got mammals and then us homo sapiens. So today we're going to tell the story of this chart. And this chart has four big puzzles in it. The first puzzle is why did the Cambrian explosion happen? If life was small for 3.5 billion years, why did it suddenly get big? And no, the answer is not just oxygen. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Reese, and I'm not just gonna give you the simple but wrong explanation. No, I've spent dozens of hours on this. I've interviewed biologists and experts like Andy Knoll, Neil Shubin, Michael Levin. I've read a bunch of books on this, and I've even made 20,000 note cards to remember what I've learned with the goal of trying to give you a real answer on how everything evolved. So let's dive in. Okay, this first question, why did the Cambrian explosion happen? Why did we go from small life to big? Well, the answer is that phosphorus weathering enabled a eukaryotic oxygen food web. So there are two pieces to this. One piece is that it was the phosphorus weathering that enabled everything. And the second piece is what did it enable? It enabled this weird new eukaryotic oxygen food web. We're gonna look at both pieces there, but before we do, I wanna emphasize something here, which is that when people talk about the Cambrian explosion, they think that there was maybe some kind of new body plans available, that we got these sponges, that we got creatures. It's like, no, 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 no. It was all about the phosphorus going in the water. And then when you have a very phosphorus rich water, then the whole biosphere rearranges itself around that phosphorus, okay? And then when it rearranges itself, remember that phosphorus was the first ingredient. When people talk about this, they often talk about the oxygen food web. They're like, oh, the rise of oxygen and that created the Cambrian explosion. It's like, no, no, no. What created the rise of oxygen in the first place? It was the phosphorus weathering. It was the fact there was a supercontinent breakup. Yeah, we're going to talk about each of these now, starting with the phosphorus piece and then getting to the food web afterwards. But before we do that, as a reminder, where is this in the big scheme of things? Here's a timeline of the Earth, starting with the Hadean Eon, where things were hellish, and then life began around here, you know, four billion years ago. We had very simple life, then life had that eukaryotic endosymbiotic event, where we created the first little eukaryotic creature. And this was the really enabling moment that enabled the big life later, but it, we kind of had to wait for a boring billion, a billion years in here, to wait until we shifted into this new phosphorus reality, where then we could have the Cambrian explosion here. And the crazy thing is that we had small life for this whole time, and then boom, it got big. And people actually use this as a way to disprove evolution because it was so sudden. The Cambrian explosion was so sudden. You had nothing in the rock, little small creatures, small creatures, small creatures, and then boom, the Burgess Shale, we found all these really, all these shelly creatures there. We found crazy fossils that looked like this, which implied a Cambrian sea that looked kind of like this with trilobites and shelly fauna and things. And that those creatures were a shift from the single celled, you know, little creatures down here like bacteria, up into the kingdoms that we know today, like plants and fungi and animals. And so why did it happen? Well, often people will show a graph like this about oxygen. And I wanna kind of disprove that notion. This is a graph of oxygen over time. We had the great oxygenation event here, very important. And then around here, people are like, oh wow, rise of oxygen, Cambrian explosion. But this doesn't explain why the oxygen was there in the first place. This is a similar graph where you look at, oh, we had the great oxidation event, and then we had a big glaciation afterward, and then we had the boring billion, and then boom, you know, oxygen levels rose, and the first animals appeared. So it must have been oxygen. Well, no, the key thing here is that actually you had the Rodinia supercontinent, it broke up at this time, and that's what gave the phosphorus that enabled cyanobacteria to create all that oxygen. And so here's our little chart that will show why the Cambrian explosion happened. And you can see here that it happened after these other events. And for each of those events, you can kind of look at them across these three or four categories where you say, what was happening physically? What was happening ecologically with the creatures? What was happening genetically? And then earth is just this way to, another way to show the physical world where you say, here's what earth looked like at the time. And so let's start by looking at the earth over time. And remember, we're gonna be looking at it at the period, this boring billion, you know, from one 1.8 billion to 800 million years ago. Then this Neoproterozoic oxygenation event where the world got a lot bunch of oxygen, 800 to 720 million years ago. Then we had these cryogenian ice ages after that. Then the Ediacaran explosion uh, after that, which is kind of like a pre-Cambrian explosion, but without the shells. And then finally we get the Cambrian. Okay, so what did the earth look like over time? Well, the issue in the boring billion is that the earth was also boring during that time. And so you had this Columbia supercontinent, the Rodinia supercontinent, 
they were just kind of hanging out. They weren't breaking up. And then after they kind of started to cool down and you were able to have actual plate tectonics and subduction, then Rodinia as a supercontinent, it was able to break up. And that then pushed tons and tons of phosphorus into the water, which then enabled all those cyanobacteria to eat it all up, producing tons of oxygen, burying all that carbon dioxide and causing a snowball earth. And so then after that, we get a little bit of volcano. So we're back to normal, less snowball-y. And then we can actually have this new reality of you know, Ediacaran and Cambrian with this new Gondwana supercontinent. But the key thing are, are these first couple where during the boring billion, the continents were controlling all of the phosphorus and nitrogen in the rocks. And so that meant that the biosphere was in this state where the sulfur bacteria were just kind of slowly eating things versus once we actually get phosphorus in the water, then the cyanobacteria are optimized. They can start to outcompete the sulfur bacteria and they can start to do oxygenic photosynthesis and they can then create oxygen into the world. Here's a zoom in what the continents look like where, you know, 900 million years ago, you had Rodinia kind of hanging out and then it eventually started to break up by 700 million years ago and boom, broke up as a supercontinent, pushing tons of phosphorus into the water. And so here's the periodic table. You can see phosphorus here remember that these green ones are the organic elements where we have you know hydrogen and carbon we already kind of have enough of those that helped start life but then these other ones nitrogen oxygen phosphorus and sulfur those elements are the crucial for the building blocks of life and so for most of earth's history there wasn't enough phosphorus in the water and then once we get phosphorus then the biosphere is a reflection of the geospheres and so the biosphere kind of rearranges itself for that new high production high phosphorus reality making all the cyanobacteria, making all this oxygen. So here's a picture of what the seas and earth look like during the boring billion. And fundamentally you had a little bit of oxygen. It was mostly an anoxic environment where you had too much sulfur. And so those two things combined are called eushinia, which means anoxic plus sulfitic. And you get what's called this Canfield ocean where you have a sulfur cycle happening, but that sulfur cycle kind of outcompetes the cyanobacteria. Here's another way to view that where you have the kind of boring billion here, this Canfield ocean, which is very sulfitic, lots of these sulfur cycles happening. While in the modern time, you have primary productivity with cyanobacteria and other algae. And the key difference between these worlds is that this one operates when there's low phosphorus. This is called the energy growth hypothesis, and it's optimized for a world where there's kind of 5x less phosphorus around. While this one, cyanobacteria, they need so much phosphorus. They're building their ribosomes. They have a high doubling rate. They have oxygen, which is really good at creating lots of energy, but they're not good in a low phosphorus environment. And so you can see the transition to a world with lots of phosphorus or phosphate here, where you see, okay, we're starting to get some phosphorus and then boom. So we do a little bit of cyanobacteria stuff, but then especially after that, but then the phosphorus increases a ton, which allows macro life to really win and outcompete. Okay, so as a summary, remember that we were in the boring billion, the rocks had all the nutrients and phosphorus, then the rocks broke up, Rodinia broke up, it put all that phosphorus into the water, we got all that, the cyanobacteria could start to operate with it, they produced lots of oxygen, and all that oxygen plus all that carbon burial, it created this snowball earth, where then you have a bunch of the CO2 and a bunch of the methane that goes down a bunch. And so for about 100 million years, it was a very cold and snowball-y earth. So that's the first part of this answer is that phosphorus weathering allowed us to exist in a new cyanobacteria regime. But now let's talk about the second piece here, which is this eukaryotic oxygen food web. And what this means, you know, if you're just trying to be a creature eating cyanobacteria, that doesn't really work. It's kind of hard to get your nutrients from them. But if you can eat fellow eukaryotes, if you can eat algae instead of cyanobacteria, then that enables a new foundational trophic level that everybody can start to build on top of and actually create something like the Cambrian explosion. And so as you see here, even during these snowball earths, a very strange thing happens. We get algae. Why are algae important? Well, algae, aka these little protists, they work with cholesterol things. These like sterols and as they're using them for their own bodies then 
the animals and the fungi and the plants, they can also use those sterols. If you want to build a food web, you have to build it off a foundation of, you know, sterols and protists and algae instead of cyanobacteria. And this graph shows exactly that, where, you know, in addition to oxygen levels increasing, and in addition to, you know, phosphorus levels increasing from this blue amount to this red amount, around that time, you also had the sterane hopping ratio increase. So you see that where we're transitioning from hopping, which is like the fatty acid that cyanobacteria make, to these new sterols or sterols which are these building blocks that eukaryotes and uh, algae create. Here's another way to view that chart where you can see here's all these kind of sterains and those sterains, you know, we had around this time, these two big glaciations, and then in between them, we had the rise of algae. And so then we get all these different sterains that enable life to emerge, that enable big life to build on that trophic web. And so that's a transition from these phototrophic bacteria to what's called these archaeplastidia. So yeah, a crazy thing happened during these cryogenian snowball earth times, which is that during a little break during them, algae really started to outcompete and algae then enabled the bottom of a trophic web so that then in the Ediacaran, when the volcanoes were going, when they kind of pushed more CO2 into the world, which stopped the snowball earth and then enabled normal life to resume, it also enabled a bunch of glacial weathering, more phosphorus into the water. And then that gave us the Ediacaran period, which are these fronds and grazers who can actually consume all these algae. So fronds are kind of filter feeders that are up, right? While grazers are filter feeders that are kind of horizontal. And these were the first bits of big life that were able to consume algae, their fellow eukaryotes. And so these multicellular creatures were able to build on top of their eukaryote friends. But then finally to make the Cambrian, you don't just have fronds and grazers here. You also have some of these animals that need even more oxygen to move around and also have shells. And so that's when you get this new supercontinent, Gondwana, with a bunch more oxygen into the world. We finally have a world full of 20% atmospheric oxygen, calcium levels have also increased a bunch, and we have the modern phyla emerge. So why did the Cambrian explosion happen? Well, it happened because phosphorus weathering enabled a eukaryotic oxygen food web. Thank you, as always, for watching, and thank you to Roots donors for supporting this channel. If you want to understand more about the past and how we got here, check out the previous videos here. And if you want to understand the future and where we're going, feel free to subscribe here. Hope to see you then. Bye.